thanks for joining us uh, today, Casper. Yeah, and thank you so much. Quite, Pleasure to be here. Yeah, that's that's quite a story. Uh, and because you know, I would have always thought of Denmark and it's uh, globally renowned Copenhagen, especially as you know, quite a tech hub. And you know, uh, and and uh, but people are not really familiar with the thriving tech scene in uh, Bangkok. So maybe you know, you can uh, you know let us know a bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so Denmark has uh, Denmark is known to be like is Denmark is known for a variety of different uh, different things, both around like tech and culture as well as design, architecture. Uh, but one of the interesting facts about Denmark is that we we actually the nation in the world with the highest uh, unicorn per capita. Uh, so, um, so there are many people that look towards Denmark to to both for uh, business advice, best practice, uh, educational purposes. Uh, so I think about Denmark is that we are very good at educating our people towards, uh, towards better tech, towards better leadership, towards better innovation, better best practices. So it was actually some of these things I wanted to bring to Asia and combine my skill set with, um, with the things that Asia has to offer when I came here initially. So the reason why, the reason why I, I chose to go to Bangkok in particular is that Bangkok is, it is such an integrated hub. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, the, that the, tech, the tech startup world in Bangkok in particular is uh, thriving beyond what you can expect from, for example, Hong Kong or Singapore. Uh, and if you look at the overall, the overall pool of VC money that goes into Thailand compared to other countries in the region, it's, it's only about 1% of uh, VC investments that goes to Thailand, um, which, uh, of course, Thailand gets as it deserves. Like that is where the ecosystem of startups and especially tech startups is right now. Right. But for me, that's also an opportunity to, um, to, to come here and innovate. But just to put one thing straight is that like the Candio, uh, my company is a, is a bond global company. So while we don't actually do much business in Thailand in particular, we, um, we, use, we use Bangkok uh, to be extremely interconnected with Hong Kong, Singapore, as well as, uh, as, well as our, we have uh, many employees in the Philippines. Um, and I also really see Bangkok as being, to a certain extent, the next Hong Kong. Now you see so much political instability in in, the, in Hong Kong, and as well as the surge and rise of the tech scene and the economy here in um, here in Thailand and Bangkok is growing fast. So that's really a train I want to catch uh, with my company. So. So it and it just happened to collide with one of my great high school buddies. Mm -hmm. uh, he um, he's a he's a long time resident of Bangkok. He's also a Danish person. Uh, great guy, Jacob. He um, and he is now an investor of Candio. So it was a mix of all these three factor. Uh, him pulling the strings for me to come here and rattle the cage and change some things up in the city. As well as uh, as well as offering to uh, to invest in the company that I did not know at that time which company I would start, right. uh, as well as being being on the searching end of a um, uh, of a trend that is definitely upgoing uh, by uh, by being in Bangkok. So I think to to answer your question in short, I can summarize it like this: the amount of Thai friends that I have in Bangkok is uh, below ten after living here for uh, for three years, right. uh, and the amount the amount of um, Asian friends, uh, both from Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, Hong Kong, like the comp the whole region, right. is um, it, it is well beyond that. It's right. like the, the the vast part of my social circle and my um, and my ne network of influence here in the region is um, coming from other cities, other countries. So, um, and I just happened to fall in love with Bangkok uh, as well as getting a wonderful girlfriend here. So uh, that's definitely also something that, that, uh, that defines where, where I'm living right now. Sure. I mean, that sounds like a fascinating story and sounds like a story that was meant to happen. I mean, in terms of, you know, whether 
uh, finding your girlfriend or your you know high school friend being here and you know and, and it's it's just a lot of things coming together. Uh, you also mentioned uh, that you know you had sold another company. So so take us through that journey. I mean, how how did that happen? And from that company, how did you think of Candio? And what problem were you trying to solve? And and how did the idea originate? Yeah. So I I, I had I started my first yeah. Uh, like at the age of at the age of nineteen, it's actually a funny story. At the age of nineteen, I started my first tech company in Denmark, and um, and I went down to the bank, and I um, I I told my uh, I told my banking advisor, uh, "Hello, Mr. Banking Advisor, uh, I have an apartment here. How much how much can I leverage that apartment to secure financing for my coming startup?" Right. And he said, "Yeah, I could give you around fifty thousand US dollars." Mm-hmm. And um, and so I took the fifty thousand euros dollars and leveraged my apartment in in Bangkok to the like really to the edge. Yeah. Uh, and I went to I went to Upwork to uh, to find some some talent that could that could make my new app business. And not knowing at that time, not knowing anything about app development, project management, mm-hmm. uh, coding for that matter, managing people, outsourcing any uh, prototyping, anything of the, of the things that is needing to succeed with a tech startup, uh, I jumped straight into it. And after six months, I burned through all my cash and I had to close the, and I had to wow. close the company. Uh, and, um, and it's actually not until last year that I told my family about it, that I was in deep shit at that point. So, um, yeah. So what what happened was that I actually started another company uh, that was not within tech, but then I started out of my living out of my living room, and I just went like door to door to uh, try to sell the services that I had, mm-hmm. uh, and within uh, within the, uh, actually a fairly short amount of time, I managed to accumulate some money and some and some client traction as well in that company, right. that turned out to be the company that I sold almost four years ago in Denmark. And at that time, I'd worked on that company for eight, 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 nine years. Right. So, um, so like I got, I, I got. Um, luckily, I, I had that company together with some co-founders that that also had a significant share, and they were all interested in buying my shares when I, when I, announced to them that I wanted to, um, I wanted to make, to move to Asia and get out of the company. So I was in a fortunate position that they were fighting a little bit over my shares, so I could get some good money uh, for uh, for that company. Right. And uh, I also made some some um, some uh, some reasonable investments on the side uh, on the side of that. That just allowed me to um, to to think of the, the next venture that I wanted to innovate coming here to Asia. So, Candio is a uh, Candio uh, is um, we are a platform for connecting people with brilliant minds all over the globe who can who can help you assess people better and help you form better teams in your company. So, for example, if you um, if you're looking for a new AWS engineer or a new WordPress developer to uh, to make your your future project, then you can um, you, you you put up a job uh, you put up a job opening on one of a million job sites that we have online these days. Right. And maybe you have five, 10, 50 people applying for the job and they all say they are the best. So what do you do? Uh, you, you start calling them, you start screening them, you start uh, talking to them, trusting your gut feeling, seeing how you can figure out who is the best one. Mm-hmm. What we actually do in Candy is that we, um, if you have 50 WordPress developers that are applying for your job, mm-hmm. we help you we help you connect with what with one of the best WordPress developers in the world who will assess these 50 people and tell you which one they would recommend. Wow. So this is actually a, a model that originates out of Silicon Valley that was previously, uh, that was previously reserved for big companies like uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, Apple. Right. If you come and if you come and apply for a job at the, um, at Facebook, in, you're being asked to rate yourself between one to ten, right. 
And one to 10 will determine not only what salary bracket you will fall within, mm -hmm. it will also determine who will come uh, on your next interview and assess you to what degree you live up to your own uh, self-assessment. Right. So if, if you grade yourself as a, let's say that you're applying to be a Python developer in, um, in, in Facebook and you grade yourself to be a 10 out of 10 mm -hmm. uh, Python developer, right. then you will, get, you will get the best Python developer from Facebook on your next interview, screening you on that interview, taking you through everything and really determining if you are a 10 out of 10, the best in the world, or if you're maybe a six out of 10. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you if you fail to self-assess yourself, then not only will that pull your score down, it will also decrease your salary, as well as the chances of you getting the job. So, uh, th th this is one of the things from uh, from Silicon Valley that you can you they it's they really value when people they know their own shortcomings. Mm -hmm. So by by asking them to assess themselves, it it tells a lot about how modest they are in terms of their own skill knowing their own shortcomings. So I wanted to take that model and try to try to see how I could democratize that. And, um, and the amazing thing about it is that we have some of the most brilliant people in the world uh, contributing content to, uh, to Candio and contributing um, assessment help to uh, our clients in order to, in order to help people not choosing the bad apples among among candidates, right. but also help help like really helping people narrowing the field, saying you have 100 candidates, okay, we will invite only these 10 people for an interview. Right. So I, ca I came up I came up with it just because I'm I did a lot of recruitment in the past and I really dealt with this problem. Mm -hmm. And recruiting good people, um, recruiting them and keeping them over time, that's very, very difficult. And, right. um, but, but in, uh, in Candio now, it, it's, uh, like my whole team actually consists of people from my old companies and they have been, um, they have been working with me for uh, almost more than 10 years now. Right. Uh, so what I can see is that people, they really buy into my style of, uh, of both managing and leading a company, mm -hmm. but also, um, but they also buy into the vision of recruiting the 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 correct coworkers because if you don't if you don't have good coworkers if your coworkers suck then your day will suck as well because you have to clean up their mess absolutely yeah i mean it's very fascinating i mean uh, it's you very succinctly uh, you know summarize what the problem is in the sense that i mean i couldn't have uh, I always knew there was some problem, but I couldn't have described it this way. And now that I've, you've explained it to me, I'm just thinking, okay, how much does it cost to <laughs> sign up for Candio? Because this is, this is a problem we face every day and uh, not having the right people and not having the right tools to sort of assess them. So, so who are you, since you mentioned, uh, you know, about democratizing and, you know, how it used to be sort of the domain of only the most uh, you know, the powerful companies and everything. Who are uh, your clients right now? Are they startups? Are they sort of mid, uh, small to mid uh, tier companies? Who, who are your clients? Right now? Uh, so we actually have, um, we actually have companies from, uh, from all areas of the spectrum. Um, but, um, but just to be completely honest, we are lagging, we are lagging a few, we are lagging some features that, caters to a large organizations like enterprise level level clients right. which is one of the which will be one of the biggest uh, focuses of um, of 2021 to to really to really uh, to really get for example get get a better service level agreement that we can offer our clients get them um, get better um, like we are we are launching right now uh, actually today one hour before this call we launched our multi user functionality so larger clients can have several users on the platform. This was not, right. we were not able to handle that previously, but we have a, we have a range of enterprise level uh, features that we, we did, we did lose some, um, some, uh, we didn't particularly lose some clients, but we failed to onboard some clients because they didn't buy into the trial that they had. Right. Uh, so this will definitely be one of the big, uh, one of the big um, 
focus on for for 2021. In terms of clients, we uh, we had people we like we had we had people sign up from uh, from both uh, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, uh, mm. Comcast, TiVo, Kemp Bank. Um, so we. I would say our vast major our vast majority of clients they are from they are from the like the small medium uh, enterprise tier of companies mm-hmm. um, companies below two hundred employees uh, I would say that's definitely in the past has been one of our big focus uh, we also have a lot of startups on um, on our client list and um, yeah, I th- like I think th- this is definitely where we are at right now. We 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 do a good job to take care of that spectrum of uh, of clients, but in two thousand and twenty one, will definitely be geared more towards enterprise. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I can see how you know a company like ourselves, we hire multiple developers and you know uh, multiple sort of tech talents, and how this has been a huge problem. And I can absolutely relate to the whole concept of you know, firstly getting the right ones and then retaining them as well, because, you know, there's, uh, uh, uh. there's such a, such a mismatch in the market as well. Right. Which is, which is the other thing I wanted to understand. I mean, since you, uh, you know, are in this uh, very interesting position of a combination of, uh, you know, the talent industry, the human resources industry and the tech industry. Right. And, and so, because we feel that, you know, with the technology uh, growing as fast as it is and being adopted by so many companies, you know, so rapidly, if you speak to, you know, business owners, you speak to senior management in different companies, they complain about how they don't have good people. And when you speak to some really smart people out there, they complain about how they don't have good jobs. So where do you think... Uh, All good co-workers. Yeah, exactly. So where do you think is the gap? Where, where do you think, uh, you know, is it a serious lack of shortage of talent? Is it uh, a question of, you know, people just not uh, knowing where to apply or are people, you know, like for, for, for companies like ourselves, you know, uh, when we talk about, let's say 50 uh, developers or like, you know, hundred odd people, then where do we find these, uh, you know, where do we find uh, these people from? And, and because I've never really understood the whole concept of uh, paying a recruiter 15% of somebody's annual salary. I would rather pay that 15% to that candidate, uh, you know, itself. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and when we sort of post ads on a lot of these job portals, you know, we don't get the quality uh, applicants that we would like. So, so I, I mean, if you could answer this question for me, you would be doing me a huge favor. I would be eternally grateful <laughs> because I've never found the answer. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so if, if, if you, if, if I could answer that question, then I would also at the same time effectively uh, obsolete the whole recruitment industry. Yeah. Um, so I, I wish I had the golden answer to this question, but uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately I don't. Uh, but what I, what I can, what I can say from my experience is that, is that I would say, not 10 out of 10, but nine out of 10 times, I, um, I found all my most loyal and um, long-term and, uh, and productive and very well qualified employees from, um, from reaching out to people and right. just scouring LinkedIn, going through, going through applicant databases, Right. Talking to my fr- talking to my friend like very manual approach. It sucks. This is why you have recruitment agencies because that's that's what they that's what they do. That's what right. they tell themselves that they specialize within. Mm-hmm. And obviously, there are many great recruiters out there, and there are also many shitty recruiters. Just as you have um, many great or shitty people in every other industry. Sure. But but if um, like if if you want a great person. And just reach out to him and give him an offer he cannot refuse. That's how I got all of my good employees. So it, there are there are obviously uh, obviously sometimes you don't have the time span to take that approach. But um, like, can you caters to um, like to 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 two main use cases? Mm-hmm. One being, um, and this is also especially why we want to move into enterprise because when you have a when you have a brand. The, um, that people they buy into uh, mm-hmm. at the stage of applying for a job, then you also usually get so many applicants applying for a job that you don't even have time to, to sort through them to 
right. to give any attention to the individual. Mm -hmm. So can you actually solve this problem? Uh, so if, if when, when you have thousands of, um, of candidates employing for, for a job, um, like some of our clients, they're pretty big. So they, their problem is that they have too many candidates. Right. Uh, so when you have this problem, then like Candy can let you know which 10% just to focus your time on and which 90% just to discard and hurl out the, the back door. Uh, the, the other main, the other main um, uh, like use case that we have is more in late stage recruitment. You are, you are down to two or three different people that you don't know which one to choose. Right. And then, um, then we take them through Candio and you will, you will know within a few hours um, which one at least we would recommend. Uh, and ob obviously we offer indicative guidelines so you cannot turn off gut feeling or inter interconnective relations with people. Sure. So uh, if you have a good feeling about someone, then uh, he, then, then hopefully he turned out very good in Candio. Sure. But he might also turn out very bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's always a possibility. And, but I mean, just take us through the process a bit, uh, you know, in the sense that these are assessments that uh, Candio provides to different companies. So uh, are the interviewees uh, sort of taking some sort of assessment test? How, how, do, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, let, me give you, let me give you an example. Uh, if, when... Um, when what we do is that we go we go out and we cherry pick we cherry pick uh, the some of the most accomplished minds in the industry uh, mm -hmm. in any certain certain vertical. Mm -hmm. So let's take for example uh, um, uh, like one, one one example would be Microsoft um, like Microsoft server developers or Microsoft server administrators. Right. Um, we we uh, we have a lot of demand for um, for that um, for that skill to be covered on Candio. Sure. So we went out to the we we went out just to see okay who would be the best person to uh, to assess these kind of people. Yeah. So we actually found the best uh, the best Microsoft server developers and administrators in the whole world, mm -hmm. which have patents contributing to the very technology from Microsoft. Right. And um, it, like, if you, I, I won't mention any names here, but if you look them up online, you'll see that those are most, like one of the most, um, like the most accomplished people within that tech. Yeah. So, we we uh, we ask them to uh, to offer some content uh, for Candio, some some assessment material that our clients will take their candidates through. Sure. So when um, so when the candidates come to our platform, they will be taken through the test that our contributor makes. Sure. And the upside for our contributor is that he sits passively and he sits passively and receive um, a commission for, for every single dollar that Candio generates. Sure. And, um, and he just needs to offer the assessment um, one time as well as maintain it once a year. Right. So, um, and then, and our clients, they know that yeah, of course, they can find other kinds of assessments online. Uh, like the internet, the internet is flooded with assessments. Sure. Uh, and and they, can, they can also go to other assessment companies to, um, to find uh, mm -hmm. other companies that take maybe a little different approach to solve the same problem that we do. Mm -hmm. But what they cannot find is it, we're actually the only company that allows you to connect with assessments made by the best people on the like not e not even in your country, but on the whole in the whole world, right. uh, to um, to take assessments through that. So the assessments that we offer they're all fairly difficult. Uh, so so we um, we invented a scale that effectively uh, grades the, grades all your candidates from from zero to hundred. Right. Uh, and so every candidate they receive an uh, an overall score from uh, zero to 100 and that score is being computed by a lot of different submetrics right. that um, so you, you can see an overall score but you can also see how wh how that score was calculated throughout the assessment sure. and um, if you want to see like if you want to see in depth you can see in depth if you want to see the overall score you can see the overall score but you will always be able to see what was our judgment behind this candidate 
how did he perform good? How did he perform bad? Very senior, very senior employees um, on on our platform, they would be uh, able to score um, from one to hundred. They would be able to score maybe maybe sixty or seventy. Right. If they score if they score eighty or ninety, uh, it, it's very you should hire them immediately. <laughs> but okay. but if if the um, but if they if they score twenty to thirty, um, maybe forty. It, they are. They would be more suited for a junior position. Okay, so, so we actually we actually rank, um, we like we actually rank our candidates in um, uh, on a spectrum from junior to senior. Right. Okay. Sure. And and in terms of, uh, I mean, I have two follow up questions. It's 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 very fascinating. And the more you're telling me, the more I. Uh, I'm falling in love with the concept because I, I, I really truly believe that the person who will solve the technology talent problem in the world is going to be, you know, the next Jeff Bezos or something. Because every company that we speak with, all of our clients, they have a serious tech talent sh- shortage. And, yes. And, and, and the world is filled with mediocre tech talent also. Which is, which is, I mean, we, we last month we were interviewing, we posted a few. Uh, ads for full stack developer in different countries and for one of the positions we got 150 applicants and we shortlisted 30 and we interviewed all 30 and finally we selected zero you know so (laughs) (laughs) so you can imagine the amount of effort that went into the uh, process and you know it was so frustrating and then i mean i don't want to say it but we gave up on an entire country because we thought, oh my God, this country does not have good developers, which I'm sure is uh-huh. not true. We just probably just couldn't find any. So, so I have two Wait, which country questions. was it? Uh, let's not say it, you know. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> but it was, it was a large country, let's just say. So, uh, so okay, uh, I have two follow-up questions. One is, uh, is there any reluctance that you see from candidates to take these assessments? Uh, and second question is, are we uh, sort of, are we also looking at a soft skill assessment for them? Yeah. So first of all, we, we assess only hard skills sure. and, um, and, and, and all the headlines of the test that we have will be, uh, it will be a Microsoft server a developer. It will, it will be a search engine optimization. Uh, it, like it will be very, very hard skills focused uh, mm-hmm. assessments that the candidate will be, will, they will go through. Right. Um, and, um, what was your second question? Could you just repeat that? Uh, so the second thing was: Are the candidates reluctant to take these assessments? Oh yeah. So, uh, so, so the, it's. Uh, I would say, overall, I would say yes. Mm-hmm. It definitely, it definitely sucks for a candidate to take a test. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but what how what is good about the test that we have is that if um, if the candidate that he takes our tests. Mm-hmm. Then during the test, during the test, at some point, we will figure out, oh, this candidate, he is actually not very good. Mm-hmm. And so when we figure that out, mm-hmm. in the end, he will be uh, he will be offered a he will be offered a discount uh, for um, for our recommendation for his next step of education. Okay. Uh, we have we have effectively seen that your skill could need improvement. We think you okay. should consider taking this course over here. And here's a discount. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so, like I think we we not only do we try to uh, because all, as you say, all companies they have a, a shortage of uh, of brilliant tech people. So, and mm-hmm. um, I think this task doesn't stop with mitigating the risk between who is good and who is bad and who is mediocre, but right. also elevate more people uh, through um, the partnerships that we have with e-learning platforms. To um, to a better state um, and 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 a more skilled uh, bandwidth of uh, of knowledge. So, I am. Um, there is definitely some reluctance for for people to take uh, the the assessments that we have, mm-hmm. but uh, and the, again, there is not really any yes and no, right or wrong to this. Mm-hmm. Um, should you just blast out the assessments that we have? Sure. Maybe you can, but it all depends on how much the candidate wants the job. Right. If the candidate he doesn't want the job, 
then you don't care about the assessment. Sure. And you can ask yourself, was that because he didn't want the job that much anyway? Or was it because you failed to excite him about the job? Right. Um, so like, I, uh, just a, a quick follow-up on that. I would say many, many clients, um, both our clients and also uh, other companies I see in the world, they, they can be very quick to jump to the conclusion that, oh, that was the wrong candidate. Um, I'm glad that we didn't hire him because he didn't want to fill out the assessment anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I would say those clients, they should take a look in the mirror and ask themselves, could it also be that we failed to excite that person about the job and that he was actually, because the very best people, they wouldn't give a damn about any assessment. They just wait, they just wait for people to hit their inbox with some interesting opportunities. Sure. And if you, if you put up roadblocks um, towards that job, mm -hmm. they'll just take another job. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, glad you said that because I must confess that's something that I've been guilty of. And, you know, when developers, for instance, don't take the code tests, we just say, oh, well, we didn't want these kind of candidates in any case. But yeah, I mean, you, you make a very relevant point about the fact that maybe we didn't do a good enough job. This, exciting this could be the, this could be the best people. Yeah, exactly. So, so, yeah. so what, what, what do you think, uh, you know, companies like us or any company recruiting uh, tech talent can do to excite these individuals? Because, I mean, you can just maybe talk more about, uh, you know, we, we can obviously talk about, you know, some benefits and things like that. Uh, but the fact is we, you know, can definitely not change the company that we are overnight, right? So, uh, yeah, of we, course. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I am, um, I, I, I wrote a lot of articles and I gave a lot of speeches about uh, employee satisfaction and company culture. Mm -hmm. So I think these are, these are two things that really go hand in hand. And when you, when you, um, so the best testimonial that you can get for working for a company is from a current employee. And it, ob obviously there are ways to measure the employee satisfaction within your company. And mm -hmm. if that is, if that is low, it, there is a high possibility that you will, that you will also get uh, low quality applicants because they're just not the good ones are just not, not very excited about your company. Sure. So um, the, the biggest recommendation you can get is from a current employee, as I said before. So meaning that your current employees, they want to have good colleagues. So mm -hmm. if, if a great colleague pops up in their circle of influence, they will naturally refer that person to you. If, if they like working for you, so to give an example is that like we in Candia, we do um, like we make a great deal out of keeping employee satisfaction high and we make a great deal out of um, like knowing the individual's particular needs and just uh, keeping, keeping the overall uh, team moral high uh, as, as, as well as really uh, making, as well as really making sure that if we have a bad apple within the company, Right. We make sure to get, to get rid of that person fast, uh, but but also um, uh, re like really encouraging to elevate the, the good people that we have. Sure, understand. Well, I mean that's food for thought. Definitely time for us, and I'm sure a lot of organizations to introspect as well and see you know what we need to do and how we can maybe highlight the team culture more and you know more about the organization that attracts uh, high quality talent. Uh, sometimes we sort of tend to take these things for uh, granted as well. But, you know, I think one of the things that I, I see a lot of companies missing, obviously, is that company culture, that sense of pride that comes from, uh, you know, working for a company. And I, I don't think it's just a function of how big a company is, but also like you touched upon, you know, what unites the company and what the value system is. And like you said, for your own team and how they sort of respect your management and leadership style, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of, uh, you know, C-level executives would be listening to this and, you know, really truly introspecting, or I hope they would be. Uh, so uh, just, uh, you know, since, since I think the product itself, the concept itself is uh, quite unique and I think it really solves a serious problem. Uh, maybe we can talk a bit more about what it was like to build the platform and, you know, do you think it's been an easy experience building it in Thailand or, or are you also collaborating with, let's say, developers 
uh, across the region to build and continuously enhance the platform? Yeah, so we we have a, we have our own in-house development team uh, on uh, on Candio, and uh, obviously, at, probably as as every product product owner out there uh, possibly know, it's not easy to put together a product. There are certain there are certain ways to do it, and there are certain ways to definitely do it wrong, and there are certainly many ways to do it uh, not so wrong or better. There is no single one way to, to do it right. right. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because when you, when you start writing the first line of code, it's very difficult to know how people will respond to the finished product. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always, it's, it's always so important that... Uh, so we, we work a lot with an agile mindset, um, right. delivering in increments, uh, delivering fast in sprints uh, and getting things to market fast and mm -hmm. getting a lot of client feedback as well as iterating fast on that feedback. Right. So, uh, so not only not only is it important to uh, to 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 know as early on what it is that you need a few years from now, mm -hmm. but also <laughs> what advice do you actually listen to? If you listen to all the advice that you get. Right. you end up taking your platform in all directions. Right. And so, um, so, so I, 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 Candio has definitely been, um, we have definitely, we have definitely had our fair share of product challenges, mostly because we, um, we started with, we started with a very quick uh, go to market strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually made a mistake of holding on to that go to market strategy for too long while we should have reiterated uh, to a more sustainable strategy, we we grew out of our um, of our of our uh, like we can we call it Candio version one. We grew out of that at some point, and we and we uh, we just we decided to stay within that framework for for an unsustainable amount of time. Right. So that's um that that's actually what has been pushed a, f a few hours ago, and we um, we pushed the first version of our Candio two point um, th we pushed it only in Latin America with uh, to our market there, mm -hmm. so um, I'm extremely excited about seeing how that will uh, how that will go because right. there are many obviously we have many new features and um, there is a whole new uh, framework that we are building upon and so many exciting features going for uh, that that will uh, that will come to the platform going forward. Right. So the one the the one advice I would give to the the future product owner who uh, who sits with a startup idea or sits with an idea for an IT platform mm -hmm. is just prototype, 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 prototype. Right. Um, the the more you can prototype, and the better you can prototype, uh, that investment will come back to you in return, ten x, hundred x, maybe even a thousand x to um, to the amount of money you invest in your prototype. Right. Uh, so take that prototype, talk to people about it, go mm -hmm. back, iterate, talk to more people about it, and then um, and and then uh, and then build. Obviously, when you when you have a great prototype, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I mean, we actually uh, experienced that very recently. There's a product that we've been working on, and we uh, thought we were ready to push it live on 15th of September, actually. And, mm -hmm. and then we started sharing it with, uh, you know, some uh, industry professionals and we realized that they couldn't really figure out what we were trying to build. So the user, yeah. <laughs> experience, the user experience wasn't intuitive enough. Uh, so they, they theoretically completely loved the product, but when it comes to using it, they just didn't know what the next step was supposed to be. And so uh -huh. uh, we are revisiting uh, the UX. So, so I know what you're uh, referring to and something... I think, yeah, every founder uh, should definitely spend more time in. And yeah, I mean, because, and, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the first part. I was speaking with another, uh, you know, associate of ours who runs an ad tech platform. And, you know, we were discussing something similar the other day, uh, you know, about how we sort of, you know, fall victim to our own sort of uh, reluctance to change, right? So in the yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just like, no, this is what I believe in. And so sometimes we stop listening to 
uh, what the market is telling us, and we just yeah. kind of try to flog a dead horse sometimes, you know. So that's that's another thing that <laughs> we're about yeah. So like I I I really I really care about problems that uh, that excites me a lot, and one of the product one of the core problems that excites me a great a great deal is is prototyping, and how can how can I teach more people to prototype better, or how can I spread that idea which is also why i actually i invested in a prototyping company uh, on um, on, a, on a side note of kendio and um it's it's it, 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 it's really a product also that um that uh, that excites me a lot because i if like if we can just help a few people uh, a, a few more people uh, incrementally prototype better mm-hmm. then uh, then not only would that company make more money but we would also like we would also save so many founders from bankruptcy uh, <laughs> and, uh, and like not, it, it's not even a worst case scenario it's it's yeah. just a, a real deal like every every year where well, I, I saw this statistic the other day every year approximately 50 million companies open and every year 45 million companies they close wow. for various reasons yeah, yeah. Um, so um, it's just Get your product right. Don't listen to your own feelings. The only thing you can count on is they are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I mean, but yeah. I mean, like most people absolutely lack the awareness of, uh, you know, the fact that their feelings are most likely wrong, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, but again, I, I guess the 45 million uh, companies that uh, shut down, they probably learn their lessons and build the rest of the 5 million companies. Yeah. That's that's the thing. That's the thing. They they don't learn their lesson. Right. They go out and start other companies and they fail again. Yeah. Exactly. So I think it's more, it's mostly a human aspect um, and a mindset aspect about how to approach product building. So, okay. um, and like again, if you if 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 you are like if you are sitting with an entrepreneur, you who are listening out there in your stomach. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure both of us we can uh, give great advice on how to uh, not build a product, and also what we would recommend in terms of building a product. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so one of the one of the interesting things that we are moving towards actually is that the past, the past, uh, the past two years, uh, like from our launch, we have been live for around two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, from our launch, we have actually been usage based, uh, meaning that, meaning that every client that we get. They uh, they come and they pay they pay a price for the service that they want, and that service will be uh, like they buy candidate credits. Mm-hmm. So the more they want to assess, the more people they want to assess, the more candidate credits they have to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, from today uh, and um, like rolling over the next few weeks, we will be rolling over. We will be migrating to to a sub, like a fully subscription based company. Right, and I'm extremely and um, partially nervous, but also excited about seeing how my clients will respond to that, sure. because um, uh, like we have a we have an, an advisor on our board, uh, and I call him Mr. Subscription, uh, because uh, it's it like have, taking taking a usage based company to a subscription based company in theory. Um, should elevate like the the value on paper so much yeah. um, so um so like once we will be so much uh, so much more able to measure our monthly recurring revenue uh, mm-hmm. as well as our user churn which uh, we have been able to to some extent but also right. not really accurately because people they didn't really churn they just came back once they had uh, they once they had the need again they would return the right. platform and spend some more money Right, right. Yeah, I mean, subscription is a tricky one. And of course, you know, everyone knows that subscription is the answer for, you know, all of, you know, a lot of these software platform solutions. But uh, it's amazing how such few platforms can get it right. And again, I think it's just the the stickiness and how good your product yeah. is eventually. And then if, if yeah. it is really good. And so, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, development that you went from a usage based platform uh, into a subscription based platform, because I think uh, a lot of companies, a lot of startup founders that I see is they start uh, subscription uh, based models on day one. 
and when users don't know enough about them and maybe the platform's not mature enough and 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 i think uh th and that's probably one of the reasons uh it doesn't work out for them as well so so that's another very interesting approach that you sort of highlighted there uh, uh again coming back to you know thailand and i i because you know for a lot of our clients and you know uh, let's say especially in europe since you are from europe it's, uh you know yourselves so what would you say uh, you know are the advantages of let's say you know european uh, founders to let's say come to asia and not not go to let's say berlin or copenhagen or london for that matter so do you see any advantages of coming to asia i i definitely see so many so many advantages there mm -hmm. uh, and one of the biggest advantage that i see here in um, i wouldn't say necessarily in southeast asia but mm -hmm. in um, in thailand for sure in mm -hmm. philippines vietnam for sure uh, to a certain extent in malaysia maybe a little bit in india and pakistan but um the the biggest differences and the biggest advantage is that in in um in for example denmark there is an abundance of people who uh, educate themselves with leadership and Uh, management theories and uh, like leadership theories or leadership styles mm -hmm. people they are standing in line uh, managing things managing people uh, being being the director of something right um being more like strategically focused mm -hmm. where uh, which but but there is no one who wants to be uh, it's not true when i say there is no one who wants to be led because there are many people who wants to be led in Denmark as well but mm. uh, but the majority of people are definitely going into higher senior level positions sure. why where um, where where it's like it there are not so many people who uh, who who uh, who in who are aiming for the lowest bracket of uh, entry level jobs right. uh, and this is something i see in uh, in, in in many countries in southeast asia Mm -hmm. there are many people who are very good at what they do right but they need someone to lead them <laughs> right mm -hmm. so if you're hearing this and you have a manager experience or if you um, if you're good with good with people skills or understanding people and leading people in the right direction forming teams then there is a whole region of the world who is just waiting to be led towards a victory by someone who has a great vision about something. Mm. And so this is this is definitely one of the key differences I see. Um obviously there is a financial aspect to it as well. The the money I got from my company in Denmark uh, lasted me five times as long as they out here as they have would have in Denmark. Yeah. Uh, just for the sole purpose that uh, our biggest expense which is salary uh, is um, just significantly lower. and 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 it's um when i when i tell some of my friends back in denmark what uh, what what i pay my staff uh, mm -hmm. they look horrified uh, <laughs> because because they are comparing that number with a right. danish salary yeah. which is not it's like comparing apple, apples and bananas but right. um but what we do is that we actually we actually pay people above market like above market rate always compared to yeah. the salary that they could go out and get elsewhere right yeah, so um so so the, the which is actually which is also one of the things that ensures that we get uh, that we uh, that we get that we get better people to candio mm -hmm. um but if 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 i could do it all over again mm -hmm. i would have done the same let's just leave it at that well yeah that makes you know a lot of sense and and of course yeah i think uh, for you know a lot of people listening in who are based in europe or north america they would probably not realize until they experience it for themselves you know what amazing talent uh, there is in asia and especially southeast asia and especially oh, they are so good cost. yeah exactly and and especially at a fraction of cost and and again i mean i think before anyone jumps to any conclusion uh the lower salaries are not uh people being exploited or anything it's just a function of the lower cost of living so and, and exactly. a lot of a lot of uh, you know sort of tax friendly jurisdictions as well so uh you know a lot of their salaries are not going into taxes so there are you know a lot of those factors to consider because 
uh, sometimes I've seen with some of our you know, European clients, they sort of uh, are concerned and rightly so uh, is the fact that, uh, you know, they say, I hope you're not underpaying some of these people. And, you know, I hope these are great working conditions. So, I mean, just to reassure them, yes, these are amazing working conditions and life is exactly in Southeast Asia as well. And, and it's just that the cost of living is so much lower and the tax rates are so much lower. So employers are very happy and employees are rather happy as well. So, uh, exactly. Yeah, and, and also uh, from 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 the employees' point of view, they have so many more opportunities because it is an emerging, uh, you know, uh, you know, nerve center of technology development globally. So I think that's something that is great for employees as well because they have so many more opportunities than they do in a lot of other parts of the world as well. So, uh, and, and and the the world is getting smaller by the day. So, yeah. I, like I would say, you you as a either as a project manager or a, a future founder of something or an idea holder, the, the quicker you can get used to the, to the thought of having a virtual, a virtual office, uh, which means like no physical office that people go to every day. Uh, by the way, Candy is a 100, um, 100% virtual company. Uh, I'm, um, like, I'm sitting right in, my, uh, in my own apartment right now. Uh, which is also obviously due to uh, COVID nineteen, but but we um, the sooner you can wrap your head around that thought and not letting geographical borders uh, limit the limit the amount of uh, of talent you can onboard or the reach you can reach towards either clients or uh, or, or clients, suppliers, or customers, uh, or um, or even like or talent to uh, to watch your company, the the more success you will have. Without a doubt, uh, so um, so you I like I could I could execute Candio from Denmark, and I could hire South I could I could hire Southeast Asian talent from my home country, but it's um, it's just a lot more present to to be here in in a similar time zone, mm-hmm. uh, as well as um, as well as connecting with um, with with a region of investors that I would not have uh, been uh, been able to connect to otherwise. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you touched upon the, the time zone bit. And that's something that I always uh, find interesting. So how do you think, uh, you know, does the time zone actually impact uh, co-workers working together? So we work, you know, a lot with, you know, different time zones. And I think it's just a uh, function of adapting rather well and you know what do you think is the best way to do it do you think uh, you know like a couple of hours every day if they can sort of uh, overlap you think that's good enough or do you think it makes a huge difference if uh, everyone is in the same uh, time zone yeah, I don't I don't think it do I don't think it'll do a huge difference because uh, what 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 we do in Canada is that there is no nine to five mm-hmm. uh, people they people they um, People they they manage their own working time, uh, as as long as their delivery is good, mm-hmm. uh, they, and as long as we are on track to milestones and timelines, mm-hmm. they, then things are great. People can manage their own time, but mm-hmm. in return, I also expect that if 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 I also expect them to jump on a meeting uh, either early morning or late night, mm-hmm. if if there is something that is relevant for one of my employees across right. time zones, sure. uh, and. I don't think I don't think that's unreasonable to ask. I, I just say to my pe- I just say to my people that this is what I expect, and um, and, um, and they're usually totally fine with that because they know the flexibility goes both ways. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so so yeah. I mean, uh, in the sense that I think what you mentioned, the time zones are not a huge factor anymore. You know, having a virtual office or not having an office is the, you know, everyone, I mean, although I hate to talk about the new normal and when the world talks about uh, how COVID-19 has changed everything, I always just say that things had changed long before that. So, so I think the concept, you see companies like GitLab, which are 100% uh, virtual and have been for the longest time. And, you know, so it's always been the case, but it's just that now a lot of conventional companies are going, uh, you know, completely remote. So that's, a bit of a revelation for a lot of people, but I think we were well on our way to uh, becoming totally a global out, you know, a workforce without any borders and without any sort of time zone restrictions. So 
Uh, just, I would like to, uh, you know, ask you a, a last couple of questions before we let mm -hmm. you go. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, first is uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, you are planning to bring Candio to a more enterprise grade, uh, you know, uh, platform. So what do you think is, uh, you know, sort of the difference or what do you think it takes? To, uh, because a lot of, you know, our clients are trying to sort of push, position themselves as enterprise grade, uh, you know, solution providers as well. So uh, how, how do you, what do you see is the difference between uh, targeting, let's say the medium uh, to small to medium companies to, you know, targeting very large companies in terms of the solutions itself? So all the, all the, all the quotes that we lost mm -hmm. um, towards enterprise level clients, we lost them because of the, of the lack of being able to, um, to deliver in-depth service level agreements. Sure. Okay. Uh, so um, this is something that, so like ensuring deliverability and ensuring mm -hmm. uptime, ensuring stability uh, on the, on the platform, meaning that if we, if we have an outage, we would, Candy would get a daily fine because we have this agreement with, uh, with the big client who pays for, uh, like it, it, he, he doesn't really care if he pays hundred thousand dollars or $200,000 a year. Uh, obviously it, there, there is some sort of price sensitivity, but sure. price sensitivity is not the, the deciding factor. And I think that is what people they need to understand about the enterprise level clients. They, 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 they care. They care more about their um, uh, their need being solved, and it being solved good and fast, mm -hmm. and very thorough and very stable and always reliable. Then price come like down the line. <laughs> so delivering on these things is not as easy as one, two, three. It's um, there are there are a lot of different things. Like for us, it is it is a ship that we need to uh, navigate, like change the course on a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and just to be like obviously we uh, we we have been we are still a young company. We have been uh, we've been like live for a couple of years. We have outages. We have outages from time to time. Right. Uh, so um, so so there are there are some things in our whole value chain that we will need to revisit uh, in order to provide uh, in order to provide the um, the things that uh, the client they, they need on an enterprise level and sure. um, then second secondly um, we uh, we have been facing because we are, because we're dealing with uh, with uh, personal data mm -hmm. we have been facing a lot of requirements on, uh, on on privacy protection and data protection from our clients and how we ha and how we handle that, as well as how we help our clients handle that. Right. Uh, so there is also a lot of things that we need to visit on on that note. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's it's not that much on the product side because the product is good. Uh, it's more on all the sub factors around the product, where mm -hmm. not even one factor can be uh, can be out of order or not up to expectation or fifty percent to expectation. All of the factors need to be 100%. Otherwise, the enterprise client will not touch you. Sure. That, that's very interesting because, again, you know, uh, a lot of founders would just uh, automatically assume that I need a better product. I need a bigger product. But, you know, like you, you mentioned, that is not just about the product. It's everything that goes, uh, you know, along with it, right? So in terms of... Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. the service level agreements, the, you know, the, the support, you know, a lot of protections and sort of insurances, so to speak, in the sense that, you know, being prepared for every eventuality because the stakes are higher. So obviously the chances of things going wrong are a lot higher as well. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a great insight. Uh, yeah. Okay, and, just, yeah. It's, and, and so support, support is another, uh, support is another factor. Obviously we yeah. like, we, we, we have a 12 hour support window. Mm -hmm. Um, which is also something we lost a client on on an enterprise level that we could not uh, that we could not guarantee twenty four hour support. Right. Uh, we, we just cannot guarantee that at this point. <laughs> even even with the money we got from that client, we would not be able to establish twenty four hours guarantee. So <laughs> I'm sure you'll get there soon enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
just a couple of things. One, what's your prediction for the job market in the sense that what's your, uh, you know, prophecy about where we are headed uh, globally in terms of, you know, the job market? Is it going to be skewed? Is it going to be, uh, you know, our recruitment, uh, the process? Do you see any major disruptions coming our way? What's, what's your overall prediction for how, uh, let's say five years down the line or, or even three years down the line that you that you see are the biggest changes that are likely to happen in the in the recruitment uh, globally uh, so so yeah you, you you briefly touched based on this yourself and um, and when you said that it, it's not it's not the world that is changing because of covid the world has already changed covid just made it more transparent mm-hmm. uh, so I definitely see companies, um, I already see companies, many companies um, transitioning away of full-time employment uh, and instead keeping a, an arsenal of freelancers around them that they can have, that they can have on demand uh, as, uh, as work, uh, like as work or projects grow over time. Uh, or involve certain freelancers to in in a in a project on a freelance basis, mm-hmm. um, and I definitely see the gig economy uh, growing exponentially. And when I say gig economy, I'm not talking about platforms like uh, Uber or, or, or um, Food Panda or Grab or right. all these sorts of. These are more like B two C gig economy, but um, like I would. I would turn my attention more to B2B gig economy, um, which um, which will be, and I think, for example, agencies will be disrupted majorly because they are the ones who previously um, who previously sold uh, sold things on a project level mm-hmm. to um, to clients. But there are so many platforms in the world now mm-hmm. that um, that makes it easier for. For the for for any person out there who has something to sell, let's mm-hmm. say an agency an, an agency sells a new website to uh, to a client. The mm-hmm. agency has fifty employees who produces websites for clients. Mm-hmm. Um, the employees they don't need the agency anymore to get clients. They can get the clients online, mm-hmm. uh, and um, and and the clients they don't need the agencies anymore to find the good employees. They can find them online. Right. Uh, so I like I I definitely see a lot of things moving moving away from full-time employment and moving away from agency models and moving more towards a more um, like a more open space and more transparent world where people they can uh, where people they can find the skill they need and not to the same like for example 10 years ago um, eight years ago you would go online and it would be very difficult to know if the person that you are buying some service from online if you receive something good back or not, right. that is solved now. You like you. It's obviously you can still hire bad freelancers, but you there is a lot of things that has been put in place so that so that you know if a freelancer is good or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, and people are already starting to utilize this. Uh, so I definitely I definitely see that we will we will have a, a major change going towards uh, towards that in the future. Right. Very interesting. I mean, because, yeah, I, I, you know, as much as, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, companies hiring freelancers and, you know, having a tough time. But again, I think that there's a bit of a learning there as well. And there are definitely enough tools out there. There are enough platforms out there that help you hire the right freelancers. And yeah, we definitely are seeing that trend as well. So uh, yeah, I mean, basically what you mentioned was the world does not need many uh, middlemen, so to speak, in terms of you know mm-hmm. what what the company requires and what the talent can provide. You don't really need a lot of people who are bringing things together, so to speak. So they're very, very interesting, uh, wonderful. So uh, before we let you go, one last uh, thing I wanted to ask is, what's your what's the first thing you want to do once the pandemic is over and the world comes back to normal? Oh, I'll go travel. <laughs> I have so many. I have so. I have so many. I'll. I'll go visit my business partner in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's the very 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 first thing. Right. Uh, and and then uh, I'll take my girlfriend and go uh, go somewhere very nice outside of mm-hmm. Thailand and um, 
and see some beautiful things and get some beautiful experience with her. Yeah. And then, um, and then, uh, yeah, like the, these are definitely the, the, the very first things that, uh, that I'll do. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that sounds uh, dreamy right now, and I'm sure the and, millions. Yeah, sorry, go on. And 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 now I cannot. Now I cannot let my girlfriend listen to this podcast because she knows that that she will she will not be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she will you for that, uh, or maybe <laughs> to Hong Kong, and I'm sure the millions of people globally who are desperate to come to Thailand. You know, they can't wait for you know, the pandemic to be over and I hope it is over soon. So Casper Dam, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, know. thank you so much. And uh, it was wonderful. And we wish you all the best uh, for, you know, the next many, many levels of success for Candio. And I'm sure it's just a matter of time where it becomes like the go-to solution for enterprise level clients globally. And, I hope uh, so. I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah, and uh, enjoy the holiday as well, as soon as you can get yeah. it happen.